We all want to see it. We all know what's coming. Michelle Rodriguez is a beast. And Chris Pine hasn't done a character like this for quite some time, and I'm excited to see what he does with it. And Hugh Grant is in it. Oh, and about a dozen of the most iconic staples of the Monster Manual since its first incarnation. I'm talking about gelatinous cubes, displacer beasts, dragons, owlbears, apparently intellect devourers, mimics, liches, and probably more. These are monsters almost every D&D party will encounter at some point in their adventures, so let's take a look. Quickly going to mention this will not be a complete overview for we will be here for quite some time. Nope, this is a brief rundown of the monsters, their abilities, some cool little facts about the trailers, or so no spoilers per se, just assumptions and cool stuff. Gelatinous cubes. Oh, these need to be in every campaign. Gelatinous cubes are large, slow-moving cubes, normally filled with a corrosive substance that is sentient and quite aggressive. These are challenge rating 2, have 84 hit points, a move speed of about 15 feet, and they are immune to deafened, blind, and charmed, prone, exhaustion, and frightened. Quite the list of immunities, and they need them. Because with all that, all their hit points being so hard to see, they have one of the lowest armor classes in the game. A grand total of, and drum roll if you want to do it, 6. That means even the spindly wizard in the back can hit this thing in melee if they need to. Oh, and about that being hard to see, the cube is usually so transparent that to even see it in the first place, your players need to make a DC 15 perception check. That is if it hasn't moved or attacked. Gelatinous cubes have a pseudopod attack within 15 or within 5 feet, and then their main ability, which is engulf. Engulf literally drags an unlucky character into the cube, restraining them, slowly corroding the victim with its acidic ooze. This does 3d6 damage or acid damage when it first enters, and then. 66 per round until it escapes, and it can hold up to 4 medium or smaller creatures in its space at any one time, or one large creature. Big, big bad boy. It's not all bad though, when in the cube you do have full cover, and when not trying to kill you, gelatinous cubes are great for dungeon maintenance. As they are a rubbery, non-solid being, they can mould their bodies to their surroundings, and usually take any dirt, mould, insects, or carrion along with them as they make their ways throughout their homes. A notable one to throw in your campaigns would be the Cormerian Ochre Jelly Fused Gelatinous Cube, playfully known as Jelly Cube. Jelly Cube was created and domesticated by a local wizard and charged to keep the streets of Suzail clean. Sadly, this Jelly Cube was short-lived as they quickly developed a taste for horse. And if you're wondering, yep, they first appeared way back in the first Monster Manual in 1977. Moving on to the coolest kitties in all the realms, the Displacer Beast. Displacer beasts are large feline-like monsters with two large tentacles that sprout from their back that have barbed pads on the end. These furry foes have six legs, a tail, massively intelligent, and oh yeah, they are never where you think they are. It's in the name, people. They have the unique ability to displace their form through means, allegedly, by manipulating light through vibration of their body. Not a magical ability in a sense, though some believe it to be, but yeah. These are CR3 for 40 foot speed, 13 AC, 85 hit points, and a basic multi attack with its tentacles that deal 1d6 plus 4 damage on a hit. That displacing ability of theirs really does a number on your players because until they hit it, all attacks against it have disadvantage. These beasts love to hunt. They are particularly cruel in enjoying the kill too, and just to let you in on a wee tactic that they love to use, when they are confronted by large numbers, they will go for the squishiest first. That's you, spellcasters in the back. These critters were inspired by a beast known as the Coral. A coral, a coral, 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 a coral. From the A. Van Vogt sci fi story Black Destroyer, and were added in 1975 in the Greyhawk supplement. Now, dragons. <laughs> Particularly a dread, red dragon and a black dragon. Now, if I'm not mistaken, I think I know this dragon. As in, if you have played the Out of the Abyss module, this looks like Thembershod of Gracklestar. But, back to dragons. As we've seen a black and red dragon, these are chromatic dragons, which tend to be evil. Metallic dragons, such as gold and bronze, tend to be good. Dragons in D&D become more powerful as they age, so medium wormling, which would be from 1 to 5 years old, would be a handful for a party of 3rd level adventurers. Whereas an ancient red dragon, which is CR24 and Gargantuan, would be over 800 years old. So I would mention CR and AC and specific attacks and resistances and all that jazz, but there is honestly 24, or sorry, 34 pages on dragons alone in the 5th edition monster manual, so... 
They're an evening read all on their own, and the lore just goes deeper and deeper on them and their abilities. So we'll quickly mention that most dragons have blindsight, so they are incredibly hard to sneak up on. They have breath weapons of an element that they're tied to, a frightening presence which can send the most stalwart adventurers fleeing, and innate spell casting. Dragons are seen as the endgame villains you will likely encounter, as most of them are extremely intelligent, powerful beyond their, any mortal's abilities, and a sense of self-righteousness that just leads to that villain arc, you know? Now, as you will see in the trailers, red dragons have fire element breath attacks, and black dragons have acid breath attacks. I will mention something I didn't get a chance to fully dive into in another video of mine. Red dragons struck a bargain with an ancient Githyanki lich to help them eradicate mind flayers from existence. Bye bye Illithids. That's why if you've ever seen the trailer for the Baldur's Gate 3 game, the Gith are riding red dragons. And since I didn't mention much about black dragons, there is a cool little piece of lore about a particular black dragon that roams the marshes of the Mare of Dead Men, which is a huge swamp area which is north of Waterdeep, which now that I think about it, it's actually halfway between Neverwinter as well. Anyway, the Black Death, or Vorag Manthar, or Varagamanthar, I think it is, is supposedly the most vicious of the black dragons in the northern Faerun. Yeah. It erupts from the marshes without notice, and when a formidable foe enters their domain, Varagamanthar moves with such speed and agility tirelessly, as if they were in two places at once. That's because they are. Varagamanthar is actually two identical twin black dragons, named Varagamanthar and Wervarender. They like to keep it a secret that they are in fact two separate beings, and more than once as an army or group of powerful beings attempted to rid the mayor of the dreaded Black Death, only to face down two black dragons. It's very, very sneaky. Moving from sneaky to very brash, owlbears. Okay, I love owlbears, they are absolute units. Likely the mad experiment of a wizard gone too far and one of the top five most memorable, notorious, anonymous monsters in Dungeons and & Dragons. And I don't say that lightly. Your players will want one as a pet or a travel companion, and heck, I would almost give it to them. These feathered four-legged foes have a vicious beak and claw attack, are large in size, AC of 13, speed of 40 feet, and 59 hit points. Sure, they're only a challenge rating 3, but they pack a punch and will embody the odd and twisted magical world for any new players at your table. 10 out of 10 should be included in every campaign somewhere. They tend to bear hug their foes to death, have dark vision, I mean of course they do, and if I were to ever throw one at my players, I would have it so it chooses the largest of the party, locks eyes with them, and begins circling on hind legs, with its head just fixed in that gyroscope-like head that owls can do. Now, for their little fun fact. You know honey badgers? This is the honey badger. Watch it run in slow motion. It's pretty badass. It really doesn't give a shit. Honey badger don't care. Honey badger don't give a shit. It just takes what it wants. As the Guinness Book of Record calls it, the most fearless animal in the world? Well, owl bears are like that. They will take on monsters far bigger than itself and often with great success. They don't shy away from a fight, only when they have a full stomach will they consider even backing down from a threat on their territory. And bonus cool fact is that they lay eggs. So whether you want them to be a chick or cub, that's up to you DMs out there. No, Mimics. So one of my most viewed videos on this channel is on Mimics. So if you want a deep dive? head on over there. People seem to like it, and there's really good comments in there with really evil plays by DMs, but very cool. Ironically, Mimics are not your ordinary monster, at least I think ironic is applying here. Anyway, but that's the fun thing, they're basically just normal all the time, just regular everyday objects. When your player's kicking the door to that dungeon, maybe have the door kick back. These amorphous globs can change shape but to nearly anything. They alter their bodies to have pseudopod-like appendages, have classically been depicted as chess for those all too eager loot goblin players. They exude a sticky adhesive which holds their prey in place while they attack or dissolve them. And it's normally by this part of the sentence the new players are weeping in terror at the thought of encountering this, and the DMs are giggling like a child. The classic D&D joke of the innkeeper asking the adventurer party, why do you wear armour and carry weapons everywhere? To which the party responds, mimics party laugh, the innkeeper laughs, the table laughs, the party kills the table. They are no pusher over either, and for their fun fact I will say that the mimic depicted in the monster manual is for a feral mimic, not a normal mimic. The difference being that normal mimics are more clever, better laying at ambushes, and even been known to speak, or learn to speak at least. But they are shown here with a 12 AC, 
CR2 immunity to acid damage, 58 hit points, but they are slow at only 15 feet of movement. There are some parallels between Mimics and Gelatinous Cubes, but apparently they're of no relation. Again, it was something a mad wizard cooked up in their spare time. Speaking of mad wizards, let's talk about liches. Liches are what happen when those bored mad wizards wake up one day and realise that it hurts just that little bit more to get up. Your bones creak just a little too loudly and your skin isn't as fresh and as young as it used to be. You're getting older and soon you'll pass on. So you have to do something about it. Ha! Huh. What if we can't die? Because we're already dead. That's some 5 head 200 IQ thinking right there. So they undergo a ritual, a transformation, to make their skin pale and necrotic and fall off till they're just rickety bones that creak off each other and as they move, it doesn't hurt anymore but ugh, they can't feel anything. Oh and they have massive spell casting abilities and oodles of necrotic energy to draw on and gain all those spooky ghouls, whites, spectres and undead minions to run to swarm your players. Liches can live for thousands of years, amassing multiple lifetimes worth of magical skills and abilities and magical items, developing their cunning schemes and tipping the dominoes centuries ahead of their endgame. If you as a DM want a bad guy who is plotting or has been plotting for centuries, from shaping bloodlines to mapping economies, liches are the big bads for you. Liches typically have an AC of 17, 135 hit points, poison, bludgeoning, piercing and splashing damage immunities from non-magical weapons. They've got true sight for 120 feet, legendary resistances, and can rejuvenate after they've been killed thanks to their phylactery, which is a small token box which they've tied their soul to should their body ever be destroyed. And they're a CR21. That's a jump from what we've been talking about so far in this video. And as is their undead boon, they have a flair for necromancy. Which leads me to this big bad. This is Zastam. As far as the lore holds, Zaz is centuries old lich and the current ruler of the Red Wizards of Thay. So let's go in order. Zastam. Zastam is a member of the Zulkir, eight powerful Thayan wizards who specialize in each field of magic. He became leader of Thay by overthrowing their last Zulkir in the Civil War of the 1395 DR, placing his own loyalists in power and ruling absolutely as their puppet master. Zaz is a storied character in the D&D lore. He first appeared way back in 1st edition. He was born in 1104 DR, which is Dale Reckoning by the way, and was taken on as an apprentice as a child due to his magical potential. I'm cutting this short, but he thought he would be better on his own. Hired adventurers to gather magical items of great power, kill them when they got too strong, hired spies to keep track of the Zulkir, eventually killed his own mentor, and then resurrecting him as a servant so as not to waste a good skeleton. Amassing a small following as his skills grew until he eventually had the Zulkir overthrown and became the Regent of Thay. As far as his personal life goes, it's often noted that Zas is actually quite charismatic and polite. He would show respect to those who foiled his plans through wit, intellect and skill, and even when enraged would merely be cold and direct. I'm not mad son, I'm just disappointed. Some even actually referred to him as pleasant. It's not bad for a person to kill their way to power and keeps hordes of undead around. The Red Wizards are an order of wizards who rule Thay. They're a mix between a government and ruling class. They cultivate the talented youngsters of Thay and train them to either become great warriors or powerful wizards, or more recently, trade tradesmen. Sorry, merchants, what I'm on about tradesmen. These new wizards choose a specific spellcasting school, so evocation, illusion, destruction, etc and then they dedicate their lives to the mastery of it. There are regions within Thay that normal public cannot roam unless on special red wizard business, or even then some regions locked off specifically for wizards of the order alone. Thay is a country in the eastern heartlands of Faerun continent, on the planet of Toril. Just in case you never knew the name of the planet that the majority of the D&D games take place, it's Toril. Thay is a mageocracy where the classist decimation is, or decimation is Bias towards the upper classes. Thay has a massive population of undead laborers. This low cost labor force kind of forces the living residents to undertake more complex roles with minimal pay, leading to hardship and serious cost of living issues. This essentially traps the living residents until they can afford to leave. Until then, they are subject to the servitude of the Thayan wizards. And I really do mean servitude. Thay has a long history of slavery and its rulers. 
the Zolkir and Zastam, they are adamant that it will long continue. Thane's appearance are not relatively normal, though those with power or station have shaved heads or no body hair at all. The shorter the hair in their society, the higher the station they hold. They are often adorned with tattoos, clearly visible, and their demeanor is normally self-serving, seeing that the strong willed will or strong willed will strive over the caring and compassionate, and boy do they loathe other species. This is top-down propaganda to keep the regular people of Thay fighting amongst each other and not the Zolkir. We'll briefly mention the Red Wizard Zofina here. Zofina is clearly part of the Order of the Red Wizards and is a very powerful spellcaster. They will no doubt be a terror to our brave party of adventurers and a spectacular foe. Now, this last monster I will mention here, I'm not really sure I should because we don't know what this is. This could be a gargoyle, but the way they were created, I think this would fall under an animate object spell. This would explain how the statues just come to life and under the control of Safina no less, so yeah. Only reason I don't say for certain that this is an animate object spell is it's not in their spell list. Oh yeah, this is where the fun little facts start coming. We have Safina's spell list. We have stat blocks for all the characters thanks to D&D Beyond. I'll add the link for these below. First, for the wee fun facts, this is not a monster. I was twisting my head trying to see any discerning marks or anything that could tell me what it was, and then I seen Sophina's stat sheet. This is Evard's Black Tentacles, a spell that summons tentacles from a dark eldritch plane to accost and hold your foes. This horn is likely the Horn of Orcus. Orcus is the demon lord of undeath, and as such it makes sense that Zastam would use such an item to create more undead for his army. Kinda got a feeling that they're gonna name it something else, but you know. Oh, this party in the maze scene? These are a little hat tip to the original D&D cartoon. Look, it's all the kids. And this dude better make an appearance too. Okay, now for the controversy. The wild shape into the owl bear or owl bear for a druid was not rules as written because they have a sea horror that's too high. But this is where us as DMs get to blur the lines. If one of my players wanted to disguise themselves as a horse, throw off the fooled guard while charging or changing into an owlbear, attack another, cause utter chaos and distraction, and then mid 30 feet leap, changing back to ride off on another horse, that player would get inspiration from me, and I'd probably make it so if they wanted to go off book and do an uber shape change like that again, we would have to make a list of what they wanted to change into, give it a percentile chance for success, and it would take an action, and they wouldn't be able to try it again for a week. That's fair and balanced in my head. And cool, this is Simon Omar, who's the party sorcerer, and if you don't recognize that name, well, it sounds like Simon is a descendant of the great Elminster Omar himself. If you're unsure of who Elminster is, well, I encourage you to check out the books by Ed Greenwood, which have shaped the Forgotten Realms for decades. If it weren't for the stories of Elminster, we wouldn't have the D&D we have today. And this one isn't really a monster related tidbit, but Doric, the shape changed druid, is actually a tiefling. A lot of folks thought that the horns were a headdress in the early trailers, but we can now clearly see a tail. Humanoid features with horns and tail means tiefling. Or it could actually be a number of other species like a cambean or a satyr or satire, I can't remember. But it's a pretty good bet that they are a tiefling. Anyway, I can't wait to see this movie. My mates. Can I call them my mates? I think I can call them my mates. The Session Zero crew. Josh, Billy and Callum. They made it to the premiere. Jess then joined them for a night in the Tower of London where they got, where they and other guests got to meet the main cast. Directors John Francis Daly and Jonathan Goldstein. Sue Perkins was an MC and apparently there were many challenges and quests for the guests to partake in and there was some really crazy food. I don't know, it looked amazing. They looked amazing. They all gave kudos without spoiling the movie, because they're cool like that. Jess then got to see an early screening with a shower of amazing folks, thanks to Aces, where they crafted a PC to look like a mimic. I know this is not something I would normally cover, but kudos where it's needed. The promo stuff for this movie with events like that are just top notch. Now I don't want to be the person to hype something up without seeing it, but I really am looking forward to this, and those that have seen it say it's a great show. So maybe believe some of the hype? Either ways, I've covered some of the most or some of these monsters in more detail in my previous videos, which I encourage you to check out. Like this one on liches. It's good. Talks about how you become one and what it means to be one. Yeah. Anyway, take care. Have a good weekend. Hope you enjoy the movie. I'm going to go see it tomorrow. Bye.